What would you define death as? It is a fiction of the ignorant, created by the ignorant. There's no such thing as death, there's just life, life and life, moving from one dimension to another. Good evening to everyone. I think it's, a, it's an honor to, to be talking with Sadhguru. This subject which is… It's quite strange that uh, the first poem I ever wrote in my life, which I, when I didn't even understand what I was writing, was about death. <laughs> and then we explored together in, 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 in Kashi and Sadhguru enlightened me with a lot of aspects which I never thought about. And after that we lost someone in the family and more questions started coming around it. I will start with that poem. This is the old first one. This is my first poem. That's nice. This is a and it's quite, an in, quite a coincidence. And the, the, the thought is, 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 is in the kind of Hindi I used to write then. So a lot of things, uh, probably my mother used to call me Kathin Kavya Ka Preth. So that, those days I used to feel pride in using words which nobody will understand. So I will explain it to you. Basically the thought is, upper luck is when you don't blink. So when you look at something beautiful, you become upper luck. Palak nahi lagti aapke. When you die, you don't blink. What have you looked at? Is death so beautiful that you never blink after that? Apalak niharna sondarya ko anubhuti ka dyotak ban jata hai. Apalak niharna sondarya ko anubhuti ka dyotak ban jata hai. Apalak hi ho jata hai manushya jab karta hai alingand mrityu ka tab kaun si anubhuti hoti hai usse jis anubhuti se wo kabhi wapas nahi lautta. Sadhguru, why is death always portrayed as dark, sinister. Why is there heaviness? Why is so much fear attached to it? I know you have called it somewhere cosmic joke. <laughs> but most of the civilizations, whether it's Egyptian, ancient, Jew, Indian, barring a few civilizations, I've seen, and I think probably somewhere also try to celebrate that but if you look at mostly the civilizations, ancient civilizations, all have some sort of heaviness and even the, even the, the symbols, if you see Yamaraj as a symbol, if you see, or you see the, the Grim Reaper, you, you see there is some heaviness and darkness and certain kind of imagery which comes with death. Why is it so, Sadhguru? If we look at how we have perceived and portrayed death in this part of the world, you will see that death is not seen as sinister. But the dark patch of the death is for the living, that there is a loss. Loss is always a dark thing, whether it's small things or big things, People break down when they lose something that's precious to them. It could be things, it could be people, it could be many things, you know. So the darkness is only concerned with the living about the death. But the death itself in this culture particularly always been portrayed as a grand event. It's only now that Indians are imitating the West and walking with faces held down, otherwise even today it is there. When people die, we wear white clothes, not dark clothes. 
There is a certain science behind that, I'll look at that later. Above all, there are wonderful stories. The legend goes like this, Shiva is always waiting at the Mahasmashan. He's made that his abode because he's waiting. And every time somebody dies, he dances in celebration. What kind of a pervert can he be? <laughs> that somebody dear to me is dead and he will dance and celebrate. Let's look at the fundamental aspect of what life is because they're not two different things. What we call as life right now in the experience of most human beings is just the body that they have accumulated and a certain amount of thought and emotion that they have accumulated around themselves. It's very clear to any human being who pays a little attention to the nature of his life that he can clearly see that body is an accumulation, the psychological structure is also an accumulation. Now, beyond these things, there is life. So what you call as life is, when you were children, I'm sure uh, you definitely did blow some soap bubbles. When you blew a soap bubble, the bubble was real. But what was inside the bubble is just the atmosphere all over. When the bubble burst, burst one drop, of the soap water fell on the floor, rest of the… the whole content of the bubble, where it went, you can never see because it's just… never was because it's just a part of everything. This is the nature of life. The whole cosmos is a living mass of life. You built a bubble, when the bubble burst and th for those… if somebody has a perspective of the other aspect or the other side. Let's… let's look at life and death like this. You're in this side of the wall, somebody else is on the other side of the wall. When the bubble burst and this air which was… or this life which was trapped in this bubble became released and what's happening on the other side is way bigger than what can happen within the trap of physicality. So he is laughing, singing and dancing because one life got released from the mortal coil as it has always been described. Sadhguru, the… the fact that somebody has gone and this calamity or whatever you call it has happened, is it a conditioning that we have to perceive it that in… in such a big way, such a big event, I remember there's… there was a death in the family and an old dead woman had died. And I'd gone there and there was a kid playing. And I told you about this earlier, that a child was playing with a pinky car. And very naturally, while he was playing with the car, he went over that body, dead body. When people pulled him, he started playing like… Is a, is, a, is a thing like there. Such things happen on Mumbai so, street also. No, but the child had no… no registration of that. Yes. Is the registration learnt? Is the registration a conditioning? See, uh, the death being seen as a tragedy is physiologically, psychologically, emotionally and socially a reality. Existentially, it's not a reality. A child is an offspring of life. He's not yet a slave of social conditioning. So he will even play with the dead, <laughs> it wouldn't matter. But adults will try to condition the child because they feel it's inappropriate, something has been lost, or above all, they when somebody dies, you think it's the end of the world, actually. If somebody is very dear to you, in your thought, in your emotion, most people would, would actually feel that it's the end of the world. But after some time, they come around. 
Now the child doesn't take that time lag, he comes around quickly because he's not so influenced by <laughs> what's happening in the society. This is purely psychological and emotional structure. When I say psychological and emotional structure, it's our making. We could make it whichever way we want. And you will see in this country when somebody dies, maybe all the so-called educated people have given it up, but if somebody dies in the slum, they'll beat the drum and they're having a party. I'm not trying to belittle the loss that a person goes through. But all psychological factors, your thoughts, your emotions and social opinions and situations are only relevant to a certain point. Beyond that, existentially, what you think, what you feel, what your society thinks are absolutely irrelevant. That is why we always positioned one who we consider as the highest on the edge, he's always on the cremation ground. This is how every yogi starts his life. Today, those who are seriously on the path, we always se send them to the cremation ground to spend a certain amount of time because mortality has to sink into you. You must understand the essential nature of your life. Only when you realize you're mortal, the longing to know beyond will arise. If you think of God, you will not become spiritual. Actually, you could become very stupid. You will try to think that by… you know, you could do idiotic things in your life with a prayer, everything will be fixed. You don't do your job properly, but you… you think there will be a result. You don't study for your exam and you think you're coming first class because of your prayer. All kinds of idiotic things will happen. But the moment you address the mortal nature of who you are, the longing to know what this is all about, wanting to know what is beyond this thing that people are here, real, real, and tomorrow morning, poof, suddenly absent. What is beyond this? Wanting to know this will become a natural quest and that is the spiritual process. But, uh, Sadhguru, the mortality, if you… if you're told that you're… you're only six months left, one has seen… if one is told that you have six months left or one year left, suddenly there is a change in behavior of the human beings they start prioritizing a lot of things and a uh, lot of changes happen. But don't we actually know we are mortals? Don't we actually know that we have limited times, but we still don't want to believe that we have limited time? Why does… why does a human being behave as if… is it a denial of a kind? Unless you are definitely by medical science told that now your time starts. The time has already started, the clock is on <laughs> uh, If you want a prediction for all of you when you will die, I can tell you uh, somewhere little less than hundred years all of you will die <laughs> The clock is already on but it needs a doctor's uh, warrant or a judge, you know this <laughs> The nature and the creation and the creator have already told you, but you still don't believe it or you have not paid enough attention to it. It's like this. One day, uh, a bishop, a Catholic bishop and a judge met on the golf course. A judge is playing golf, Catholic bishop is sneaking the game, that he is not supposed to do these frivolous things, but he is playing, he likes it. So, but uh, he was feeling little uncomfortable because uh, the judge hits the ball straight, his ball with God's grace goes in every direction <laughs> So he said, uh, what is so big about your profession, you're a judge. At the most, what can you say? You can say, may you be hanged, but I can say, may you be damned <laughs> So the judge paid attention to the ball, took a good shot and then he looked at him and said, when I say be hanged, they hang <laughs> <laughs> Sadhguru, the… the way we treat our bodies after death, 
There are a lot of rituals around it. On one hand, we keep hearing that this is a transition, this, is, this was a body you were in and it is meaningless after that, it's no meaning. The Atman has left the body. Why do we have so many rituals around that body? I, I'll just recite, I try to insert a little bit of poetry in this so that, you know, so because the questions in this subject are not actually sufficient to, to convey a lot of things. But since one has encountered death and one has tried to capture this here, it's about the cage and the bird has flown away. And you're looking at the empty cage. Cage, that's the, that's the, the scene on your head. Panchi ud gaya, pinjra khali. Panchi ud gaya, pinjra khali, tar tar, ekaki sitar, chedo to sannata, kato to khun nahi. Panchi ud gaya, pinjra khali, tar tar, ekaki sitar, chedo to sannata, kato to khun nahi. Kaso to tootne ki dhoni, ab lakdi hai, अब लोहा है पर फिर भी लकड़ी को स्पर्श करता है मन लकड़ी को स्पर्श करता है मन कभी सम्मान कभी प्रेम कभी वितृष्णा सामने बाहें खोले खड़ा आकाश सत्य बता चुका है सामने बाहें खोला खोले खड़ा आकाश सत्य बता चुका है उस आसमान में विलीन हो चुकी है एक उड़ान पिंजरे में नहीं है अब चरैया की फुदक फिर भी आंखें ताकती हैं खाली पिंजरे को स्मृति कोश डबडबा जाते हैं कुछ भाव कलश छलक जाते हैं आई एम नॉट दैट गुड विद द लैंग्वेज सो दैट्स दैट्स द रीजन आई आई एक्सप्लेन दैट दिस इज अबाउट द केज इट्स अबाउट द एम्प्टीनेस ऑफ इट एंड स्टिल a desire to look at it the whole family the whole the people look at that as if somehow life will come back there, what and then we have rituals around it how is it why why do you treat bodies in various culture the way they treat you know more about it in 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 any culture i I've, i've gone to i've seen bodies have been treated in a special way what is the reason for that and if you can also talk about this embodied beings in in this context a lot of questions around that people have you know uh, requested me to ask something which is never dwelled upon and and i i know it's a, it's it's a, it's a little difficult subject to deal with but i think everybody deals with with this body and facing the dead body in front of you See, to understand why there is a certain process as to how you treat the body beyond dropping it. As you earlier mentioned, on another level people are talking about how once you have… a life has exited the body, it means nothing, it's just mud. Yes. The reason is this, as life does not engage with the body just like that. It happens as a process. When a, a woman or a mother conceives, two little cells coming together then becomes a meatball, literally. For this meatball to become a life, it is somewhere between forty to forty-eight days after conception that the life process enters. Let us understand what is life process. The life process, the life is there in the mother's body also. So where does it have to enter? Those of you who have two children, you would have noticed this, otherwise you might have noticed with others. Even on the day the infant is born, even on that day, between one child and other, characteristically they're very different. 
the way they move their hands, the way they make noises, the way they pay attention, it's very different. Same parentage, same genetics, same everything, but they're very different. Have you noticed this? Because the information package that has entered that particular piece of life is always unique, never the same as the other. This may make you write poetry at the age of uh, what? Seventeen. Seventeen. So, somebody else wouldn't have thought about poetry. Some of these things may happen because of exposure, but nobody can deny that human beings do things out of innate capabilities everywhere across the planet, there's no question about that. Now, this life process is happening and one day death happens. What is this death? Why does it happen? The information package, which in traditional terms we call as karmic body or it's called a sanchita, a large package of information. Let's not go to where it came from and all that, it'll lead us to a different place, but distinctly you can find out if you observe just born two children, obviously the input that has gone into them is different. Every mother would know it, every person who works in a hospital or a maternity home would definitely know it because every day observing children born, distinctly different, always, even if they come of the same parents. This package has two different dimensions. One is called a sanchita, which is a warehouse of karma, huge information. Where does this information come right now? How do we generate this information? There are five senses – seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Every moment of our life, this is gathering input. For example, if you walk from here to here, I'm saying if you walk ten meters, there will be twenty-five different kind of smells. Most of them you will not notice in normal course of observation. Only if it's acute, either it's too pleasant or too unpleasant, you will notice it. All the mild things you will not notice, but all this is recorded. Every sight, every small inflection, every sound, everything is recorded. Suppose you're sleeping, fast asleep, I will come and speak in a language that you will not understand. Above all, you're sleeping, you're completely unconscious of this. Twenty-five years later, we can hypnotize you and make you speak all the sentences that I spoke without knowing the language, just repeating those sounds. This memory is deeply entrenched in the system, these experiments have been done and we have always known this. So, this volume of information that you're gathering in wakefulness and sleep is phenomenal. It's because of such a volume of information, so many aspects of our life happen automatically. If that information is not there, you wouldn't know how to walk, you wouldn't know how to stand, you wouldn't know how to sit, this will happen. Because of such a volume of information, it is assimilated in a certain way, it's not a conscious process, unconsciously it's happening. So this information will allot itself, which is known as prarabd. I'm sure in the previous generation, your mothers and grandmothers, when they see you doing something unreasonable, they said, it's your prarabdha. That means it's your allotted karma, it's playing out. Because it's allotted, that part of your memory and your information is just… that part of your software is just playing out. It's not in your hands to control it, it's simply playing out. That's what they mean when they say, it's your prarabdha that you're behaving like this. Now this prarabdha runs out at a certain time depending upon how you live. There are different dimensions to this, but let's say it starts running down. When it starts running down, the software that you have for this life is slowly wearing out. Your body may be still strong and good, but software is running out, now it becomes feeble. Once the information is become less, the life energies will become feeble. Once life energy becomes feeble below a certain point, it will exit the body. This is considered a normal death, this is a good death. It's a good way to die, that you ran out of the software and you exited. Most people choose to die <laughs> in a way that they break the body in some way and they make the body inhospitable for life, either with a car crash or a heart attack or a lung cancer or whatever. In some way, 
we made the body inhospitable for life, so life exits. If the life exited because it has run out of software, then this life is very feeble, there is nothing much to be done about this. Guru, where, where do you… where do you think or where do you suggest where life begins? Is it in the womb? Is it when you are delivered? Is it… when do you… Th when do you… When, when does the soul enter the body? Now you are assuming things. <laughs> well, I have… I have heard from… from very… I mean, whatever my learning <laughs> no, no. and conditioning you, as you can call. Now I am talking about you and me and people here. Now you are bringing an other person called soul. Yes. Uh, let us use the word life because the word soul okay. is heavily contaminated. Uh, you know, people are finding soul mates. <laughs> it's very clear, <laughs> it's very, very clear. Your body needs a mate, your mind may need a mate. But the soul, if it is absolute, it definitely will not need a mate, isn't it? Uh, but so many things have… let's call it life. Okay. It's… it's less co <laughs> corrupted word <laughs> So the life that you are, the person that you are is different. The person that you are is the making and molding of many things that have happened around you, the impacts that life has had on you, external life has had on you. But the life that you are, which keeps all this going, this has come with a certain information. If it runs out of the information or the software is gone, then this life exits the body because its term is over. But if its term is still on, but you break the body for some reason, now it exits. When it exits like this, now the reverberance of life is at a higher pitch. It should not have left, but it has left. Now for this life, a lot of things have to be done, otherwise you will leave it in the wild and it will go on. What would have been, let's say, if it lived in this body, maybe in another three years or five years it would complete its term. But without a physical frame, this five years may become five hundred years. Why I'm saying this is, time matters to you only because you're physical. Right now if you sit here, now this session is for two hours only because you have a body. Because in two hours, it wants to go to the toilet, it wants to drink, it wants to eat, it wants to do so many things. Suppose you had no body, we could make this two centuries session, <laughs> two millennia, what's the problem? Time is a consequence for you only because you're physical, because you gathered your physicality. If you did not gather physicality, time would mean nothing, space would mean nothing. So when you leave the physical frame, now, time and space does not mean anything, but because of this, it, because the reverberance is still there, it can go endlessly. No, when you say you leave, you know, you almost assume and that's where probably ordinary person cannot relate with. When you say you leave, as if you have the choice to leave, you said that this, this guy, this life decided because of accident or whatever to leave. This life did not decide. At least the way we, we see our loved ones around us, we see somebody else decided, some happening decided. And well, there are other kind of deaths one hears about, the samadhi and conscious dying. Probably that's not the kind of dying this is. This is an accident. Also, I would like you to explain what is a stillborn baby? What is the lifespan of that which is stillborn? Now, where that manifestation gone? Where is that prarabdha gone? Now, uh, let us look at the varieties of death, the menu, death menu. <laughs> because uh, <laughs> just today morning somebody sent me a mail saying that someone has opened a death cafe in UK. <laughs> so, let me give you the death menu. <laughs> the different ways a human being can die is, before you're out of your mother's womb, you could be aborted. Abortion is one form of death. The next is, you can call it stillbirth, it could have happened beyond a certain time. This after conception has happened, 
and life has entered this somewhere between forty to forty-eight days, that is when it becomes alive. I don't know much what the medical opinion is, are there any doctors here? Huh? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm saying this from my personal experience. It's forty to forty-eight days, that's a space where you enter. There are some lives which enter later. Suppose, see this is something uh, a woman or a mother could feel if we train her a little bit. If she sees that a life entered beyond forty-eight days, then you're delivering somebody truly special because this life will take time to settle in. Some phenomenal life is on the way. You have heard somebody sees, uh, uh, you know, Gautama's mother and this man says, you are going to deliver a phenomenal being. Somebody looks at Yashoda and says to the mother, you are delivering a phenomenal being. This is simply because when you notice, after forty-eight days of conception, still life has not entered but enters a little later than that. This means you are expecting a phenomenal being to arrive. Why it is so, if I go into the intricacies, it will take you somewhere. But normal life enters somewhere between forty to forty-eight days. Now after this, for some reason, after all womb is a manufacturing unit of this body, for some reason if the the, uh, the body did not form itself appropriately for that life or for any life, then the life chooses to exist before it's delivered. So this is a stillborn baby. Or sometimes because of whatever compulsions a mother may choose to abort the child, that is another form of thing. But in these things the engagement with the body for this life truly begins somewhere approximately between eighty-four to ninety days is where really life gets engaged. Till then it's foraging, it is looking if this is suitable, if this womb is the right place. This is not a conscious thing, this is an unconscious tendency-wise, it is seeing if it matches by tendencies. The appropriate word for this is traditionally we call this vasanas. Depending upon your vasana, you're looking for an appropriate body. So, though it is partially engaged, it can exit before ninety days, before between eighty to… eighty-four to ninety days, the life gets properly engaged. From then on, it's a proper baby, from then on it's a proper life. After that, you should not disturb that, you must nourish it, it doesn't matter in what context it has happened. So, this life process, this is abortion, stillbirth, next thing is, an accident can happen, it can be of any kind. That means body broke. Because the body broke, life cannot sustain itself in that body, so it exits. The next thing is suicide. Because of some extraneous situation, somebody decides to end it. The next possibility is death by occult processes. This is one of the worst ways that things can happen because it destabilizes the information match which has entrenched you in a particular system. When I say the information match, the tendencies of that particular life is seeking a match with the genetic material the parents are providing. When that match is disturbed, people will die a terrible death. Terrible for various reasons because not only for what they may go through at that time, terrible because of the long duration that it takes to solve this issue that's happened within itself. So. Death by occult processes and the next thing is, as you already mentioned, a samadhi or a conscious way of exiting. This is the whole menu. So if you had a choice that you could die the way you want to die, would you like to live in any of these ways or consciously? Because it's the… it's the last act that you perform in your life and you get to do it only once. You may get married four times, but you can only die once. <laughs> so, <laughs> you must do it in style, it's very important. <laughs> but Sadhguru here, when you said accident, I… and… and… and find the life is accident. But there are few people who go through this life support. Now, 
What do you call that? Is that a period the person is there? And, and also when you're, you're talking about um, uh, samadhi and, and, and conscious dying, um, you know, one had seen in India there was a way people used to leave the place and go to a, a place like Kashi and will die, the preparation for death. And uh, in, in today's context, how do you see that? The preparation for death or dying, dying gracefully or going somewhere else? And, uh, please, and so the two questions, one is about life support. What is the state of life in the life support? See, uh, the business of the doctors and the medical science should be to help the living. It's not for them to enter the realm of death. As you said, it's life support, not prevention of death, okay? So somewhere this line must be drawn. It would be fantastic if you can train medical prof professionals to be able to see when it is not so. But that would be a dangerous thing because misuse will happen. People will pull the plug on people who can't pay the bill or whom they don't like, you know, <laughs> things will happen. So because of that, we are just allowing it to go whichever way it goes because if you touch it, all the consequences of it you cannot control. So you support the life only with the hope that it will recover and once again it will be back to life. There is… nobody is supporting it with the intention that you just want to put it on the machines and run it forever. The hope is because a few have come back after years of comatose and the people who love them and the families, they are hoping against hope that this person will come back and maybe a doctor is trying to assist that. Sometimes it goes to absurd levels because nobody can take the call. Nobody is able to take the call because nobody is uh, authorized to take the call as such. So because of that it goes to certain levels. But life support is only with the hope they will bounce back. Now, if you observe a person in comatose, there are two types of people. With one type of people, the body is refusing to respond, but their mind and emotion is active. This is torture. Sadhguru, this is not exactly true. Sometime the family, the people, the doctors together, all of them somehow almost sure and have seen such situations that the guy, the person is not going to come back. But there is a kind of human consciousness, a kind of guilt, a kind of responsibility, a, a kind of love keeps the person in that state. What I wanted you to you know, throw light on is, is what is the state of this life at that point? With this, because the life is not manifesting itself through this body and neither it has taken, if you talk about rebirth or reincarnation on another life, it has not done that. So where, what is the state of this life? Above all these things that you mentioned, there is a law. If you pull the plug, there is a law for that. And that's what I was coming to. There are two conditions in this. In one condition, the body has become inert, that you are not able to get the body going. But the one who is within, the mind is active, emotion is active, all perceptions are there. This is torture because the body is refusing to move. But there are other kinds of situations, the body seems to be reasonably vibrant and active, digests food, everything is happening, but inside it's become blank. If inside has become blank, if you wait for five cycles of twenty-one days, then for sure life is gone. But body can be still kept alive because of various medical processes, you're keeping it going. Body may not dwindle because body is still strong. Without a life, you're just keeping a body alive. This is like an empty shell, but shell is kept alive. This is not a good thing to do. But if the person inside is alive, but the body is gone blank, now it's a very difficult decision for anybody to take. 
And for all you know many times, all the things that you're talking, whether to pull the plug, not to pull the plug, all this the person understands. It's… it's a very bad situation. It shouldn't happen to anybody, but when it happens, how to deal with it, there's no particular way because it's individual sensitivities. Just because the body… Uh, the body cannot get up and the person understands everything, feels everything, you can't <coughs> cut him up. Pulling the plug is as good as cutting him up, you know. So this is a hard decision to take, there's no particular way to do it. But if only the body is vibrant but inside has gone totally blank, five cycles of twenty-one days you can wait. After that, very comfortably you can pull the plug for one hundred percent, it's gone. And Sadhguru, then what is your take on euthanasia or where do you… Because here I'm… I'm also going to come to to the will, how much of will this life has and how much is it left to others. Uh, your… your point about euthanasia. Uh, in my opinion, nobody has a right to hold an opinion on euthanasia because it's your opinion, you're not making a judgment, it's not an informed judgment. It is an opinion. As I said, if life is gone but only body is there, you can pull the plug. But still, for the people around, including the doctor and the relatives and whoever that person means something to them, they see the body is good, the heart is beating good, all the parameters are good. Why would they want to pull the plug? You cannot tell them to pull the plug because they think it's on. So, I don't think… So, if, if it's left to an individual, then if he… he wants to willingly give up life. But the problem is not in a state to say that. He might have Suppose said it Suppose he's before. in a state to say that, so that brings you suicide. So, he, do you think he has the will and… and… and the right to… to exercise that? See, the simple thing that we did in this country is, if an individual decided, those who do not have the capability to smoothly exit this body without causing any damage to it, those who did not have this, they always walked away into the forest and just sat under a tree. After some time, without eating, they would just go. This is a normal vanaprastha. You heard in Mahabharata all this kunti, all the dhritarashtra and the, even the Durdarshan guy. Uh, <laughs> Sanjaya <laughs> All these people went into the forest to live on dry leaf and this and that for some time and slowly dwindle the body and exit. The body begins to understand. All the creatures, most creatures do this. You must uh, see how a cobra dies. It's unfortunate that no documentation about these things have been done. Uh, if a cobra realizes it's time to die. It will go up to some place where it will not be eaten by predators and things. Usually it will climb, climb up a tree and sit on one branch and it just sits on the branch and that's it. In about twenty to twenty-five days, it will die. Because a cobra can easily exist, its normal meal itself is spaced out somewhere between eleven to fifteen days. Because of that, Beyond twenty, twenty-five days, thirty days, it will die, so it will simply sit without eating and slowly dry up just like that. Even a creature, a crawling creature like that has this much awareness. This would be the best way to do. But even if I talk about it today, the so-called modern society which eats five meals a day, <laughs> uh, they will be terribly upset. So, this has been the normal process. If you are not a yogi, if you do not know how to exit, you come to a place, you sit quietly by yourself. If your relatives are around, they won't let you do that, they will stuff food into you, you know, because our idea of love is to stuff the people with as much as we can. <laughs> so, <laughs> they won't let you do those things. That's why people went to some place, sat in a place where the energies are good, because ha being in a positive, live energy space is important because to be without food becomes very effortless if the outside energy is conducive and supportive. 
If the outside energy is little depressive, you will see you will need lot more food and the compulsions of food are strong within you. So this is a way, but you can't suggest uh, that to modern life, they will, you know <laughs>